Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Chad Ruder. I'm the Global Chair of the IT Community of Ithma. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, uh, we are recording this. Uh, we always get the question is, are you going to share the recording? The answer is yes. I'm sure we'll get that question again. Uh, we will also be sharing a copy of some of the collateral uh, that we're going to be sharing during the session. So I think we've just about hit expected attendance for this session. So uh, Melanie, would you like to share uh, the PowerPoint? Yeah, why don't uh, we start with a quick introduction of the group? Sure. All right. Uh, I'm Melanie Stone. I work at ROI Consulting Group, but I have spent most of my career working directly on the owner side. And I was lucky enough to be involved with uh, the IFMA Digital Twin Survey this year. And next, Mark. So hi, I'm Mark Morgan Chair. I'm the uh, Customer Success Manager for Autodesk Tandem. Uh, been in the industry 27 years now, been at Autodesk for three. Um, I've been lucky enough to start out working in the field, designing, engineering, being on the construction side and then being on the owner side. So uh, thank you for the invite. Brett? Hi, uh, Brett Spindler, uh, part of the Schneider Electric uh, organization. We specifically are working within the digital enterprise piece of the business, which focuses very much around uh, the creation of solution that links operating um, and business systems together. So. Uh, really excited about the opportunities that we have with the kind of conversation in front of us around how we can take digital representation, operational reality, and tie those two things together. So um, being with Schneider, but with a background in uh, operations and in digital uh, um, analytics for operations. Thanks, Melanie. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Chris Lorraine, I'm president of Landtech Consultants. We are a civil engineering and land surveying firm headquartered in the Boston, Massachusetts area with offices down in Miami, Florida. Um, we are a 30 year old company. And uh, about uh, 12 years ago, we uh, started to specialize in reality capture and creation of uh, building information models and digital twins. And over the last five years, uh, we have specialized in integration of those digital twins for uses of uh, operations, facility management, asset management, security, and so forth, um, and integration of those digital twins. Um, today, we work uh, primarily within the infrastructure uh, and uh, uh, infrastructure and management communities um, to integrate digital twins into their operations. Thank you, and Eric. Hi, well, happy to be here as well. Um, Eric Jaspers, I've been uh, working now uh, 24 years for Plan on Software, which is a, a manufacturer of IWMS or CAFM type of systems. And um, in the company, I've been engaged in product development, product management, currently doing product strategy and uh, uh, looking at the investments that we need to do in order to stay relevant, I would say. So I'm um, happy to be here and uh, looking forward to the conversation, I guess. Thank you. So we are going to take just a quick peek at some of the survey results. Um, as Ted mentioned, that will be published as a white paper in uh, a few weeks and look out for the announcements for that. But for now, we'll just take a quick peek at some of the statistics. Um, the biggest question I always have is who has taken a survey because service providers versus facility operators are gonna see things a little differently. You can see that half of our respondents are from facilities management and corporate real estate with a mix of different uh, trades and consultants after that. And our major markets served would be financial services, educational institutions, corporate real estate and industrial facilities, as well as a few other types. And we're gonna talk in just a minute about what a digital twin actually is and what it means for you. 
but we did want to get some type of baseline assessment about how your electronic records are looking because any cohesive digital twin you're going to have is going to require a lot of data. A lot of our membership has really, really good data, but a few don't have any BIM yet. Whether that's necessary is a matter of opinion. And we also ask people to rank the uh, business benefits that are most important to them. It's actually kind of a pretty close field. Everybody thought um, there were a lot of important things. The number one choice was ease of keeping record documents up to date after renovations. And this goes a little more in depth, calling out the essential elements of a digital plan. What did each of these survey respondents think should be a part of a digital twin? Now, I believe we do have a poll. If we can get that spun up for us, uh, we wanted to um, look at this. What is your role in the industry? And we'll give a minute for people to chime in. If you didn't have a chance to participate in the poll, we're, we'll go ahead and close it, but we'd love to hear from you in the chat if you have any additional answers or, or want to expand on any of your answers. Thank you so much. Okay, a good split between facility managers and technology providers. Also some service providers, some AUC industry professionals, and one person in corporate real estate. Okay, so let's move into the overarching concept of what exactly is a digital twin anyway. It's a phrase a lot of people are using. Um, let's hear from our experts to see exactly what that means to them. Mark, do you want to start us off? Sure, I'll be glad to. So for for us at Autodesk, a digital we look at a digital twin as a digital replica of the of the built asset. You know, it's it's a kind of a digital reflection of itself. You know, we're we're looking at the the bi-directional connections, so kind of like an ecosystem. We could do an ecosystem of digital twins that enables operational and behavior so that we can see the operational and behavior of what's going on with other systems inside the building. So basically, we want to have a digital twin that is a digital replica reflecting real world conditions. And that's that's the Autodesk definition. Okay, um, next, let's hear from Brett. What do you think a digital twin is? Um, why, don't, why don't we start with Chris? Can you share your vision of digital twin? Sure. Uh, for us, um, we feel that a digital twin is a uh, graphic representation of some element of your particular facility that will benefit uh, from being able to be monitored or, or controlled uh, through a remote environment. In our particular case, uh, that refers to a 3D model um, that we would generate through uh, reality capture methods, whether it be a, utilizing a BIM model or an as-built model, and then integrating that model with various aspects of your uh, particular facility, whether it be asset management, uh, facility management manuals, um, security cameras, uh, remote sensing operations, and so forth, 
anything that assists our particular clients with the operation of the particular facility. Um, I'll go next. Uh, as a facility owner, I think a digital twin is a cohesive environment of editable data. I'm not sure if that is in a single solution. I think it's probably not because we receive and send information through so many different formats. Um, okay, next up, Brett, could you share your definition of a digital twin? Yeah, with pleasure. Thanks, Melanie. So from, from our perspective, we think about things in terms of a virtual representation of a, a asset, an asset or an object or space, okay? Now, we typically tie that digital representation to a visualization. Within our business, we think very clearly that there is space for something that is not directly linked to visualization. So if you would have it um, a, a, digital, um, a digital twin, but a mathematical twin rather than a visual twin, something that relies on the, uh, the representation of that object and the behavior and operation of that thing, space, equipment, um, and how it behaves, its characteristics and all these things, but within the data space, not necessarily in how it's represented within a graphical space. So um, it's quite an interesting uh, change in viewpoint because I think fundamentally we start exploring the, the possibilities um, of driving a different interaction with that virtual object um, that doesn't rely on a traditional visualization of the space. Great, thank you. Eric? Yeah, sure, it'll be a pleasure. Um, at Plan on the Run, basically, um, we refer to a uh, definition that's external to our company, actually, uh, defined in the UK um, around the National Digital Twin Program. And I'll just read it out loud because I can't memorize it, of course. But it's quite simple. Digital twins are realistic digital representations of physical assets that can be used to monitor and predict performance, feeding out insights and interventions. Now, that's the definition. But when we go look at the applica applicability of digital twin concepts throughout the full life cycle of buildings, um, I think it's very important to understand that um, in the different stages, and when it's about architectural design or technical design, construction, use, and demolition, the digital twin has a different role to play. So, in fact, we believe that how the digital twin is construed is changing throughout that life cycle. Now, as we define it, of course, Plan is working in the, in the operation stage, of course, mainly for our clients. And there is where we define digital twin as a, let's say, according to that definition of the UK digital twin program, you can apply it to very, let's say, say ident uh, um, individual things, one space, one elevator, one HVAC, uh, a full building or on a certain aspect. Now, for us in operations, the thing is like, um, I think Brett also mentioned as well, it does not necessarily need to be connected to a viewable or visual model because part of the digital twin concept in our definition is that a digital twin can also react to um, circumstances happening for that asset so it's connected to iot in the in the uh, in the um, in the use stages because there you're going to monitor actual behavior and when you see anomalies you basically want systems to respond automatically to those uh, situations that are being represented in the digital twin. We call the digital twins for operations. Eric, I think this idea of uh, the evolution of the twin through its life cycle is quite interesting, right? So I think sometimes we think of this thing as a static object, you build it once and that's where it lives. Right, but right. No, build, no building lives its whole life in, you know, as it was designed or built. So well, it evolves yeah. in the same way your twin has to evolve with it and the use of that twin over time would, would yeah. evolve with it. Yeah, I think Mark can comment to it as well. If you go to architectural design, the, digital, the twin, or when you go call it the twin, 
uh, because there's no physical thing yet. So it's basically what's twinning here, but you can talk about, okay, what's the building concept, the key functions and stuff. When you go into technical design, you're going to into dimensioning. And just once you start building, you're actually creating a physical thing as it is basically. And during construction or technical design, an, an important element there is simulation. You know, how's the building going to behave in terms of CO2 footprint or whatever kind of temperature profiles and that kind of thing. When you go to demolition, the model could come back uh, together with real data as a data as a bank of materials. So it has very different purposes. So how it's going to reveal itself to the user is of course mutually dependent on what kind of requirement that stage puts forward to the twin itself. I would agree that I think the digital twin is defined by the individual user and, and uh, as to what the user's need is to obtain out of that digital aspect. And, and I would agree that a digital twin could be as simple as a button on a screen that you could press that, that does some type of remote operation. Um, but I do also agree that the digital twin continues to evolve. And, and as the user sees those needs become apparent in their operations, uh, they should be able to add those to the digital twin. The digital twin should be able to grow with the user as based on what their needs are. Yeah, right. I think that carries on from what we all might know about facility management. Is when I first moved into consulting, I was told over and over again, our IWMS or our CAFM systems are 40% out of the box and 60% custom because each facility needs to track something different and report on it differently. And I think that's definitely showing in digital twin as well. Well, to your point, and I think and that's exactly what I mean, Melanie. So if you have a digital twin around an escalator, it will have a different type of function than you, when you would have a digital twin of a smart space. And they would have different uh, data inputs, of course, uh, in terms of IoT, different business rules on how to respond to certain circumstances that basically um, are happening. And I think in that, in that sense, it is, the digital twin principle is a very strong principle, but you need to connect it to the problems it, it, it needs to solve for the client or for the user. And that defines actually how it's going to look and how it's connected to visualization or not, you know, and that kind of thing. You know, Eric, I, I, can, I kind of see the digital twin as an asset all in itself because each individual stakeholder in the facility you know, whether that's operations, uh, you know, facilities, space management, you know, they're going to look at that unique asset or that unique twin in their own individual way. Yeah. And so if we start looking at the huge ecosystem, that data is going to add tremendous value as we go along in whatever way that twin is evolving. And so, yeah. you know, it, in, this is nothing new to anybody on this call, but, you know, like technicians, FTEs, they spend, you know, five hours a day just searching for data, where if we can adjust, even if we could flip that number, think of the, the return on the investment that could be if we just tweak our processes just right. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Mark, it's huge, right? I completely agree to your point, because instead of gathering all kinds of data out of let's say whatever business uh, the system context if you have a twin that's operating that's enterable and viewable to you as an, an individual it's supposed to be designed to help you basically do your job and yeah. uh, so i just i'm looking for the twin for this room not the next one this one you know or right. uh, that escalator or that's a track yep. and not the other ones you know so it's very focused. So eric a lot of it so but a lot of it basically comes down to contextualizing data we often yep. have all the information, but, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily know what it means until you understand how it's related to things around it right. and where it's positioned. So as soon as you start adding that intelligence to the data, it starts becoming much more useful. Yes, and then and when you tie that to something visual that enables you to interpret it, you start yeah. closing everything yeah. out, right? There's to your point, Brett. I think, and that's the, and that's why we basically define as an element of digital twins for for building operations, business logic, 
embedded in the twin itself, basically um, reading in the data and basically automating responses if necessary. And uh, because that's the thing, you know, the typical problem of, an, of a facility manager who's running, uh, let's say 20, 20 buildings or something, in each building there's a lot of uh, machinery as well. And so you're not going to have the time to look at all the models to see whether something is happening. You, you can't just spend your day uh, behind, uh, let's say, uh, a, a kind of BIM model and just uh, looking for problems to yeah. basically solve. You want the systems basically to basically automate. We talk about autonomous buildings, buildings who basically based on data um, and twinning that data, understanding the contextualization and then responding automatically instead of waiting for a person to do that. And I think that's an important role for digital twins and operations to play, looking at data, understanding the contextualization, and then basically, in some cases, you can't do it 100%, of course, uh, creating an automated response, creating a work order or an alarm or whatever, call someone, whatever, can, can be anything. Uh, and the reservation on space when there's no one in there anymore, that's all that kind of things. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's that's a good segue to our next topic, which is outlining what the benefits of BIM are. So in my facility ecosystem, if I think I'm pulling in data and pushing out data where it needs to go, as Brett said, with the context, because if I have systems bringing in the context of what the equipment is, what the building automation system is monitoring current state, and if it goes outside of the accepted state, someone over here gets an alert. So for me, it's always been about bringing in data, keeping data up to date and disseminating it to all of my internal facilities users when they need it. And that's obviously a pretty big ROI on a facility side, but it's difficult to prove. Um, could you guys give me any more examples of business benefits and how they could be proven? Um, let's start with Chris. I think a, um, you know, first off, I, I I think that a, a digital twin, whether it be something on a on a, a, a digital button or whether it be a graphic representation, and I know Mark and I probably agree more so on the graphic <laughs> representa representation, but if you don't have that data integration to it, it's not a digital twin. If I have a 3D model and there's no data applied to it, it's not a digital twin. The digital twin, regardless of whether it has that visual element or not, if data isn't tied to it, it doesn't function and it doesn't do its job. Uh, yeah. You need to tie that data to it. And as, as Mark said, Mark made a good point that to get the most out of your digital twin, spread it across the various departments in your particular facility. Let security have their camera access in a digital twin. Let facility management have access to the manuals uh, and the asset management system within a digital twin for particular assets. Uh, let the asset management system, uh, the asset managers, let them integrate their asset management system into that digital twin and tie it to that graphic representation. So that not only do you have a full, and again, I know Mark and I agree on the graphic re representation, but not only do you have that full graphic representation that's tied to your assets and all of that data that's associated with your assets, but then take it and bring it even further and bring it into uh, augmented reality and put it out on the field and let your facility personnel have access to that data in the field. And that, from a return on investment side, greatly gives you a better return on investment. If you have people, as, as Eric said, if you have multiple uh, facilities and you're looking to address a, a facility issue or an asset issue in one of your facilities, how do you find that? That's very difficult if you don't have that data tied to a digital twin, tied to the digital twin, give it to the guys out in the field that are working with it so that they have access out in the field to huge time savings. And that return investment can incorporate really quickly into your bottom line, um, especially where in our instance, a lot of our clients are having issues with uh, uh, filling vacant jobs, um, early retirements, all that knowledge is going away with people that are now retiring and there's no repository for that information. Put it into the digital twin. You know, Chris, I have to have the visualization. I, 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 I'm with you, Mark. But I, I'm not sure why that may just be me and my ease of use <laughs> or, or lack of knowledge, one of the two. Uh, but no, so 
you know, one of the, one of the, so the business benefits, one of the benefits we've got to acknowledge is do you as a facility manager trust the data coming into your system? And because if we get one piece of bad data in the system that propagates throughout and that gives us bad, bad data, and then here's the problem, they don't trust our twins. And, and with, with data and technology becoming such valuable tools, you know, how many of us use our same cell phone that we did five, 10 years ago? Data evolves, technology evolves. Let's, let's figure out how to evolve our management of our processes, the management of our data, and then evolve that into the twin, into the operation system. And then that's really going to start placing value at, at our technicians, because ultimately, where do we make our money? We make our money by maintaining that building, keeping that building running at optimum efficiency so that we can get the best return on our investment for that building. If we get those people the data they need to do their job, that adds value from the twin, even though it may not be connected directly to the twin. Right. Well, Mark, so, can I respond? Oh, sorry, Brad, you go ahead. Yeah, no, go, Eric. No, go. I'll, well, I'll well, jump in Mark, after you. I loved your point in terms of trustworthiness of data. In our definition, how we go about in creation of digital twin, the reliability and, and correctness of data is a responsibility of the digital twin implementation itself. So, um, so basically scrutinizing data, making sure that it is uh, reliable um, and it's, the representation is a, a, a representation of reality because that's what the twin for, at least for building operations is about, is a responsibility of the twin implementation. And it's not a, a question of something outside. No, it's the twin itself who's basically um, basically taking care of that. And, that's, and that should be the case because then you can, as a user, you can really trust the data if, you, if you're looking in what kind of way. And just very shortly, because we get into this, this definition, the conversation is, um, visualization, 3D visualization, an intrinsic part of it. I think what I fully support is that um, the visualization in 3D BIM type of thing is a great, great help in understanding and analyzing a situation as actually occurring. So it's for sure an element of digital twins, of course. Right. So, so I'd like to roll back for a second to something that Chris said, um, really around the the loss of of experience in the industry and i think being careful not to age myself too much let's call it a number of years ago we talked a lot about knowledge management um and having knowledge systems in place and that terminology seems to have, have disappeared a bit but in real terms i think a, a lot of what we're doing with it with a twin is creating a space to capture and maintain that knowledge Mm -hmm. uh, and then represent it in a way that people can understand. So, um, I, Chris, I wholeheartedly with you on that. I think there's two other aspects I'd like to illustrate. The one is uh, from an analytical standpoint. Uh, I'm a firm believer in diagnostics and analytics. Um, and the digital twin, um, even without visual uh, representation for us, uh, gives us an amazing tool to, to compare operation in the real world against what we expect operation to be. Um, so it gives us a really powerful tool set that allows us to look for deviation, allows us to really start to understand why, where things are not working as they should, and then take action to really start making changes. The second thing that I think is very powerful is that if we can, within our twin, capture the ongoing operation of that space, in, con in a contextualized, visualized format, when we come to designing retrofits or new builds, we, can, we have a lot of operational information contextualized so we can understand how something lives. So as we design and build the next, we can do it that much better and more in line with how people are going to use the space. Now, if we, if we don't have a twin that can represent that, we really lose the opportunity to get better and better every time we do it. So instead of um, iterating and improving, we 
just simply do the same thing because we don't know better. And that digital twin gives us such a powerful opportunity to start changing that status quo to, okay, what's next and how do we, how do we iterate to the future? Excellent points Thank there, you. Brett. And um, your points also rolled directly into my example for our next question, which is what use case can you think of in the past that would have benefited from digital twin? So the use case I had in mind is the one that I experienced most often during my career in facilities. I worked at a medical center campus that was 6 million square feet. And one of the things the engineering team got brought in for most was troubleshooting airflow issues. So we would have problems with wind tunneling and doors slamming on people and we would have to track through each renovation project separately. Now, whether that's a visualization of where the ducts are and the dampers are, or that's um, you know, data knowing this number in versus this number out, since we were going through each project separately and all the data for each piece of duct work separately, that was very math intensive. It was, it, it took a lot of you know, it took two professionals hours to find one piece of information. And the fact that we yeah. did that over and over again, you know, over, I was there for over 13 years. And that was a constant thing for us having to chase things down and see where air was being blocked off that it shouldn't have been. And if we would have had a digital twin, as you say, here is the way you're expecting this airflow to go. And it's not, and that would a lot more rapidly help you drill down to the physical space where that blockage is occurring. Um, so for other use cases that could have benefited from digital twin, Chris, do you have an example that comes to mind? Sure I do. Um, <laughs> when, I was, when I was in college many years ago, um, I worked part-time at a uh, local natural gas supply company. And um, I uh, worked overnights uh, on a security detail um, within the control room with uh, one of the managers. And it would always be that uh, the highest uh, demand for natural gas would be early in the morning as people were getting up, getting ready to go to work. And uh, in the Northeast of the US where it gets really cold, um, a lot of times we would have uh, generators that we would have to fire up manually um, in order to push more gas through the system um, when, it, when the demand exceeded what was normally going through the system. Um, I'll never forget one morning that uh, the supervisor told me to go down and start up the generator to fire more gas through the system. And I'm an 18 year old kid that's in college that just worked through the night and it's five o'clock in the morning, I'm half asleep. And I'm looking at, I'm saying, what generator? What are you talking about? How do I start this generator? Where is it? Where do I go? Um, if I had had some type of a digital twin that would have been on a computer screen or on a monitor, and, and again, it doesn't have to be a 3D model. Maybe it was a, a 2D plan, that's a four floor plan at the time. <laughs> that's what it would have been at that point. <laughs> but if I had had something that I could have looked at to show me where is that and where are the instructions? How do I start this generator? Um, would have been able to get that fired up um, much quicker and uh, alleviate any supply issues that uh, fortunately the manager knew where it was and he knew how to start. So he ran down and started. But um, obviously the digital twin can be used for operations as well and for training as well. And if that had been in place, um, we would have been able to uh, get it fired up that much quicker. That's a great example. Um, Eric, can you think of a situation where it may have helped you? Yeah, well, we have been, um, we've been looking at a, a case you know, in a hospital environment where you had elevator maintenance, of course, over every so much time. You would have visitors uh, visiting the sick. You would have patients being transported to operation rooms and kind of thing. So basically, maintenance has to be placed in a time frame where you do the minimal minimum disruption to uh, basically uh, transports within the building. So, looking at the patterns of um, of use during the week and during the month, you can pre-schedule actual um, lift elevator maintenance at times that you had do the, the least disruption, which is of course 
a nice example for operations. And in order to basically uh, do some pleasure to Mark as well, I think another one, I was um, at the uh, Schneider Innovation Summit um, last week where eBIM was uh, basically announced. So gener generative design of electrical infrastructures for buildings based on the assets and the definitions of the assets as modeled in the system. So um, I think that's an excellent example because you, yes, you know you're in your model it's stated I have this, this type of HVAC or this kind of uh, power needs are in there and so on and so on. And the system can then gener generate actually subnets and, uh, and uh, the whole infrastructure needed in order to power the building. And I think that's an, exa it's an example where you actually are going to use the model to basically extend it into uh, for a very cru uh, crucial for a very crucial uh, purpose, of course, and and that's a design time thing. I don't. I I, I said, well, it, is it a twin? Is it not a twin? But I think uh, as we are, we leave that a little bit in the middle. I think there are very many um, many um, uh, good cases to mention throughout the whole life cycle. Excellent, uh, Mark. Can you think of a use case that would have benefited? Oh, you know I can. <laughs> and mine will probably be a little different. So, but we all know that anyway. Or most people on this call know that. Um, so, what? When do when do we start the digital twin? And you know, Melanie and and everybody on the call. When do you normally get your closeout documents? When do you normally get your as built? When do you normally get your O and M manuals? Um. O&M manuals, first day of business, as-built record drawings, whenever they get around to it. So, so I, I, was, I spoke at ASHI earlier this year, and 250 people in the room, and 66% said they didn't get their closeout documents until after six months after they had been in the building. I think the digital twin can maybe not solve that problem, but can help alleviate some of that problem because if we start the twin at schematic design or when building commissioning starts and we start applying the parameters, applying the data that the operation teams or the facilities teams need at that early stages, when that air handling unit comes on site, let's tag it, let's put it in the system, let's get the O&M manual in the twin right then and there no hesitation. That use case for me, I think is going to add tremendous value. It's going to have its complications, but I think the value that we can get from early data capture, early data validation is going to be tremendous with the, with the twins and the aspect of the twin. And, and again, that doesn't, you know, Eric, to your point, that doesn't necessarily have to go with the 3D representation right there. We could start with an ID. Then we could change all that. Then we could move all that. So that true ecosystem of digital twin truly comes into play at this point. But that's what I would like to see. I would like to see the digital twin start schematic design earlier in the process and use that as a, as a data handover, as a digital handover, whatever term you want to call it. I want to alleviate the, 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 that six months of headaches that a facility manager has. I, one of my personal goals is to alleviate that headache and get, get documents and data to that team quicker and earlier than, than ever before. So, so Mark, I reckon we just round of applause and we finish the call here now, right? Because we can't <laughs> top that. Um, so Excuse I, me, that's I my passion. You, no, but 100% with you. I, I'm constantly astounded at how many people discard digital assets between design and build and then the operate maintain piece. And we just throw this stuff away and start again all the time. And mm -hmm. if we start thinking more holistically earlier in the process, we then capture and reuse all the assets that we build. And you actually then have a full life cycle of of that asset right um it's incredibly powerful and we are terrible at it we um so so i'm just going to keep talking if that's the right melanie so uh, so huge fan of what you're saying mark 100 percent with you um i think for me the place that is most exciting 
um, is coming back into um, what we'd refer to as either co continuous commissioning um, or uh, from European standpoint, really, it's more about um, condition-based monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're doing the same kind of thing is tying the operation of a space to the expected operation and then actually driving automated diagnostics through that process. Now, this is where we start saying visualizations are not important because you don't necessarily need to visualize air throw, uh, airflow through a filter or the speed of a pump. Um, to understand that there's something wrong there. So a um, great example, we've got a, a project just outside of London. We've got five buildings running, really focused on a predetermining failures. Now, not predictive, so we don't think that uh, digital or uh, digital twins in the space can necessarily predict the day and hour of a failure of a piece of equipment. Um, you know, if you want to invest in vibration analysis, heat and acoustics, sure. But typically we want to do it with a, you know, a standard control sensing. Um, it can identify if there's something going wrong. So we can focus on fixing problems before they happen. Right. And we can focus on fixing issues that are going to negatively impact people. So we found by having the approach to say, let's look at what people complain about. So hot and cold calls and this kind of thing identify underlying mechanical assets through the digital twin, um, what can we do? And we found in this particular case, we managed to reduce the call outs by 70 hours a week, wow. purely by addressing underlying mechanical issues that were going to affect how people experience the space, all driven through that digital twin. So you get two things out of it. You get a much better experience as an individual but then you also got a real reduction in the cost associated with just maintaining the status quo. So, you know, if we can free up an extra, it doesn't even have to be 70 hours a week, but if we could have free up 40 hours a week for, for a tech, imagine the um, improvement projects that we could do across a year, just by thinking a little differently about how we drive data. And just a quick comment on that, Brett. I mean, you're referring to the 70 hours a week that you save for the technicians. What about the additional hours that are saved from the lack of productivity from the other individuals that are working Absolutely. in a less than desirable situation? It's, it's the, yeah. the unmeasured uh, return on investment that you see as well. Because if you've got people that aren't working in an ideal condition, they're not performing to their expectations. That's and that's the 100%. part that you can't really measure, but is is Im immeasurable, but huge. Right. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly, Chris. We, we tend to talk about the stuff that we can, we can measure and put a KPI against because people are more comfortable if you can say that's the output. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you. The, the unmeasurable piece far outweighs anything we can measure. I think uh, we've obviously covered a lot of good ground about um, what we're aiming for and where we can use the technologies. So let's leave our listeners with uh, something concrete that they can start acting on. I would like for our team here to share what can they do now to prepare to implement digital twin down the road. Um, and Instead of ending with Brett, let's flip the tables. We'll start with Brett on that one. How can they start preparing now? I was, I was hoping to eavesdrop on everyone else first. Um, no, so. I'm, I'll go last after I, after I do that. So. No, so look, we have a, we spend a lot of time talking about digitization, the digital, all of these kinds of things. I think that the best advice we have is to reverse the order that we typically do things in. Start by asking why you want to apply a digital environment. What are the outcomes that we're hunting and how do we want to make a change to the environment? Any digital application, any digital twin has value. Okay, and this is maybe a little controversial, but has value in as far as it impacts the built world. Okay, if it stays a digital tool in isolation, in glorious splendor, all by itself, unconnected to the built world, then it becomes a museum artifact and it has maybe some historical value, but not necessarily any 
operational, practical day-to-day -day value. So consider where you want to go and then consider how you connect the data you capture contextualized to the real world, whether that's through IoT, uh, manual imports, um, or exports and information to people to use, how does your digital environment connect to the built world? Um, Chris, why don't you go next? I, I think we've we've hit that a lot of people in, in looking at the survey results as well, a lot of people already have um, some digital data. Uh, most people have some type of digital data and, and Mark hit on it as well, whether it be during the uh, conceptualization of the project or whether it be um, during turnover or, or what have you. Um, manuals, asset databases, um, you know, we have that digital data that's already available, but it sits in the corner of a computer somewhere and doesn't function to assist with maintenance or operations of the facility. Get that digital data out, tie it to a digital twin, um, whether it be something that's digitally set up or, or you know, a, a visual representation, tie that digital data to the digital twin to assist you in operations and facility management. Don't let it just sit there. Do something with it, put it to use and get a greater return on investment. You've already got it. So you utilize what you have and put it to best use by maintaining, operating, or, or even training for that particular facility. Um, Eric, would you like to go next? Yeah, of How course. How can we prepare? How can we prepare? Well, um, any digital twin is an investment. So um, my advice would be think about the problem to solve first, and a little, little bit in the, um, in the area of what Brett was saying. Think about the problem you want to, to solve first, and then think about what kind of twin capabilities would fit to that. And um, certainly in operations, um, it's my belief that you should also think about um, how can the twin help me to automate responses that so that I can basically um, alleviate some of the work that is uh, typically today in the, in the hands of workers or facility managers or other personnel and then I leave it to the system in some cases. So think about automation options. Uh, automation of response. Excellent. Mark? So what can I leave? So great. Those are great points. So I look at, at data standardization, data nomenclature, and that goes all the way down to the PDFs, folder structure. How, because that data is going to live and that data is going to propagate to many different systems. We need, we need the same room name and room number in all of the softwares, not just one software. And so I see a focus or in, in looking at data in the twins that, that I have been experiencing, we, we need to tighten up the data, whatever standard you want to apply, but we, we need the data to, um, to be that, that, that asset and we need the right data and we need it structured in a way that our operations and maintenance team can understand it. Sometimes I think we may have these BIM execution plans that are that the construction team can understand, but do we have a facilities data plan that is part of that BIM execution plan that the facilities team can understand? So just data standardization, I know that is, that's lame, but that is a big part of a digital twin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm I'm going to go a little dustier boots on the ground. I completely agree with everything you folks have said, um, spot on. Um, when, when we're being marketed these types of tools and technologies as owners, it's always about a new building. Like they're starting from nothing, they're creating something and then we'll keep it up later. Uh, but most of our facilities aren't like that. Uh, so I'm gonna say, if you want to do digital twin, that's your goal. Um, you're gonna do a campus renewal in five years and you wanna build up to it. Um, go to your mechanics, go to your 
skilled trade supervisors, go to the contractors that are on your campus all the time, find every single operations and maintenance manual they have, every single blueprint, every single napkin sketch, every resource and piece of data that they have about your facility, you want to digitize that in some form. There's optical character recognition, get those O&M manuals scanned in there so you can search them. So when you're drawing in information and trying to come up with those data standards that Mark mentioned, you've already got a big example of what you're calling things or what you have in place. You don't need to completely reinvent the wheel because you've right. got such a giant data warehouse there already. So people might say, oh, I haven't seen the, the prints to that or the CDs to that or the thumb drives, whatever. Don't believe people. Just get yourself invited down to their offices, down to their shops where they keep all their stuff. And you look up on top of the file cabinets where they've got rolls of something and binders of something. That's your gold mine. So Digital Twin is a great technology. Make use of it. Um, but you're going to have to look back to the past to build up your foundation to really be in a good position to do it right. Okay, and I think with that, we're getting close to end of time. Um, I will turn it back over to Ted and Alex at IFMA. Great. Uh, this has been awesome. I could stay on for another hour and listen to you guys talk about this stuff. Uh, I hope the audience has enjoyed it as much as we have. I uh, very much want to thank our sponsors for today, uh, ROI Consulting and uh, Autodesk. Uh, without their sponsorship, this would have not been possible so thank you both very much uh there's a lot of moving parts uh thank you uh, plan on and autodesk and schneider electric and uh Lantec consulting uh you helped uh, amplify uh, uh getting the survey out and getting uh, awareness out about this content uh, a couple of things i wanted to close up on in terms of the it community uh and kind of what we're positioned to do uh, IT Community Data has been around for about 25 years. Um, I think we've been uh, answering the same question for 25 years, which is how does technology support corporate real estate and facility management? The fun part is that uh, the technology changes about every three months. So uh, we have uh, lots to talk about, and we do have very much a global uh, view and a global following. If we can go to the next slide. Um, wanted to spend, because, you know, Kind of, you know, deer in the headlights, you know, what's a community, what's a council, and just uh, 30 seconds on why they're important. Uh, councils are vertical uh, aggregations of people that uh, want to, you know, compare notes, want to benchmark. So if you happen to, you know, manage an airport in uh, Toronto, let's say, you may want to talk to the, your counterpart that's managing uh, an airport in Atlanta. Uh, if you're in healthcare, uh, Melanie brought up her experience with healthcare. Well, you know, we do have a healthcare council, and, you know, it's really nice to be able to pick phone and go, how are you handling this, uh, to be able to have that uh, uh, camaraderie uh, across geographies. Uh, communities are really uh, you know, aligned with uh, the core competencies, and I'm very happy to be part of the IT community and collaborate uh, both with other communities and councils throughout the year developing content. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, we've, uh, I think, grown in terms of our geographic reach uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, members in over 30 countries now, which is uh, uh, great. So we do really take input from around the world on what's relevant. And I can assure you that the topic of digital twins is, um, along with ESG, the top two things that we get asked about um, uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. So uh, we're spot on today. Uh, I think we might have one more slide. Um, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about the IT community, we certainly try to do a lot. We're, we're involved with uh, events uh, in Europe and Asia, um, and all over North America and uh, Latin America now. So uh, uh, if you're interested in getting involved, uh, just let us know. And with that, I think there might be one more. We're time for maybe a question. Oh, yeah. Um, this is how you join. We'll skip this and send it out with the deck. Um, again, amazing uh, conversation today. If you want to get a hook of uh, Melanie, Mark, Eric, Chris, or Brett, uh, we've got their contact information there. And uh, as Alex said in chat, and I said at the beginning, yes, we will share a link to the recording to everyone, as well as a copy of this deck. So again, 
thank you so much. Uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. If there's any questions out there, we're happy to field them. But I want to do this again. I want to do a part two next quarter. I'm uh, just saying. I mean, this has been so good. I want to do a part two. Uh, hang on a minute. Great. Um, on that note, have a great rest of your week. And uh, October, we'll talk to you soon. You know. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 Thanks.